or are the ones who actually come on the retreat who are dedicated their lives in, in a much deeper way. So it's really nice to see you all here next week. <laughs> That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can start, Ajahn, if you're ready. Yeah, let's go for it. Then. Yeah, just give me the thumbs up when you're when it's all going. Okay, everyone. So uh, welcome again. <laughs> and uh, we're going to carry on quite obviously where we went off yesterday. We're uh, going on to the next sutta on this chart of sutta that we have. And, and uh, the next one has a very uplifting title of Old Age. So this is one of the things about Buddhism. We have all these kind of marvelous contemplations, uh, uplifting contemplations like illness, old age, and death. And this is kind of what the, <laughs> the staple of Buddhism is. And um, it's interesting because these are such uh, ordinary you know, things in human life, and yet they turn out to be much more profound than we actually tend to think they are. And when these things are grasped in the right way, well, they lead only one way to lead to the spiritual path, because it is all about realizing the um, uh, the uh, downside, if you like, of, of many of the aspects of an ordinary life. So this particular sutta again is the uh, connected discourses of the Buddha, the uh, first chapter, the Devata Sanyutta, the connected discourses on uh, divine beings. And, yeah, divine beings meeting with the Buddha is kind of uh, nice. I, I don't know. I, a lot of people would find this strange. Yeah? If it wasn't for the fact that I had been a Buddhist monk for 25 years, I'd probably find it strange myself. But once you get into this and you get the feeling for these beings, it's actually quite the, I know it's interesting. Yeah, it's uh, charming almost. It's, there's something beautiful about it. These beautiful beings with lots of marvelous qualities. That's why they were reborn in the Deva Loka in the first place. They're there because of their good qualities. And of course, they carry those good qualities with them when they get reborn in the end. And, and uh, as we shall see uh, tomorrow or later on today, there is a particular connection where you recall the uh, the qualities of the devas and you make that an aspect of your meditation practice. So uh, it is something to this, such an interesting and reading the sutta that reminds you of the devas as it. Of course, they turn out to be very much like us. They kind of glorify human beings, human beings with a bit more uh, splendor, a bit more happiness, a bit more of all of these uh, qualities. Uh, but essentially, they are not us. So uh, this Devata then comes to the Buddha and speaks a simple verse, and then the Buddha replies. And this is what the Devata says. Uh, the, by the way, the word Deva and Devata are the same. That means the same thing. This is what, she, what he or she says. Uh, what, what is good until old age? What is good when established? What is the precious gem of humans? What is hard for thieves to steal? <laughs> kind of an odd, an odd question, aren't they? Kind of strange mix of things. But anyway, this is what the Buddha replies. Virtue is good until old age. Faith is good when established. Wisdom is the precious gem of humans. Merit is hard for thieves to steal. So, um, yeah, starting off by virtue is good until old age. And uh, we find many places in the suttas where the Buddha talks about old age and the need to have a shelter when you get old. And when you get old, you can't really enjoy the world anymore. You can't do the things that you normally do. In fact, sometimes the world becomes a bit of a burden when you get old because instead of having enjoyment you have the opposite you have all the burdens of all that but there's one thing that you can carry with you there's one thing that will give you a sense of uplift and one thing that will give you a sense of buoyancy and happiness and joy even when you're old even when all the worldly things fail this will never fail you and this is virtue it is a happiness an inner glow that we have accumulated over a long time but if you don't accumulate that now, that, yeah, now is the opportunity to start straight away. And then if, before you know it, it will be too late and you won't be able to accumulate these things anymore. Now. So if you want to build up a, a, a kind of a support for yourself in old age, build up something which is there that you always carry with you, 
then uh, now is an opportunity then. And of course, it's not just about old age, but it's also about the dying process itself, but alleviating the problems of dying. And that is also done in exactly the same way. But you can feel at ease, you can even enjoy the process of dying. It sounds kind of radically strange to say that, but that is really the reality if you have lived well. You will enjoy it because you will relax and you're able to move towards something which is a, a less of a burden. You can shed some of the burdens of life and then move on to something uh, better uh, because of how you have lived your life. Yeah. But uh, it's not just that, it's also the fact that virtue is one of those things that you can carry on doing. It doesn't matter how old you are and how much your body fails and, and, and all these things, you can still be kind. Kindness is really a matter of the heart. Yeah, it's a matter of how our perception, how we deal, how we think about the world. And so kindness of the heart can always be there. You are probably still able to smile, you can still be able to say some nice words. And so, Virtue is also something that we can always do, whereas everything else might fail us. Everything else we cannot, you know, especially towards the very end of life, nothing really works anymore. The, the goodness of the heart can always be there. You can always take that with us. Virtue is good until all the age. Faith is good when established. Or you could say confidence. They yeah, the Pali word sadda has this double meaning of Faith and confidence really uh, uh, is good when established. So, first of all, what do we mean by this Pali word sadha? Sadha. What exactly does it mean? Is it faith? Is it confidence? Is it both? And I would say it is both. And we will see this later on when we come to the Anusanti, the recollection of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, how this actually works. Uh, but uh, in Buddhism, the idea of faith, it, uh, of sadha, is that you have confidence in the teachings uh, because they are sensible, because you know that they work in your own life. Yeah, the more you know how they work, the more you read them, the more sensible they seem, the more confidence arises. Uh, yeah? It is not a blind faith, it's actually a faith with wide open eyes. Uh, it's a faith that increases the more open your eyes are and the more realistic you are about things. Uh, it's about approaching reality, not shying away from reality. So in that sense, it is confidence. It's a conviction that these teachings are true. And of course, that is a, what, that is a, a very important part of the idea of sadhana. But if you use the word confidence, you lose out of the more, you could say, the more uh, the, the kind of uplifting aspect of sadhana. The idea that it's not just a cognitive or thinking thing or, or, or think about you, but it's also a matter of your emotions as well. You, you, you get, you know, if you have very strong confidence in something, you also feel emotion, emotional about it. You feel joyous about it, you feel uplifted about it. And this is what we traditionally think about as faith, is the emotional aspect. So the Buddhist word sangha combines these two aspects, the idea of the cognitive side of really being confident that something is right with the, the joy and the uplift of, of the emotional side. And both of these are important aspects. You can see it's quite tricky to, um, to render into English to translate because it has a kind of a meaning which isn't really found in any one single word in English. You can't really translate confidence slash faith because it becomes impossible in these kind of texts. You have to choose one or the other. And then you have to read the suttas to understand kind of the broader idea behind this. And then you can start to understand why faith is such a powerful thing. Yeah, a conviction about the certain teaching that also gives rise to joy. Yeah? Why this is so useful when it is established. And the, the suttas say that if you haven't got faith, then it is like walking through a desert. Then. Walking through a desert where you have no provisions, uh, you have no water to drink, and yeah, all you have is like this sand landscape or rocky landscape around. There's nothing there to sustain you, to kind of make life meaningful in any way. Then. You're walking through a desert, then, not having any faith. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Why is it like walking in the desert? What is it that sustains us in life? What are the things that kind of make life, give life that, uh, you know, moisture which the desert is lacking? And, and the answer, of course, is very often precisely the joy and happiness of the path. That is what makes life truly meaningful. 
And that joy and happiness very often arises out of this kind of pain. This is exactly what comes out of the anusatis that we have made wrong. You recall the Buddha, the Dhamma, and you feel blessed. Yeah, you feel like you are so lucky or fortunate or whatever it is to have come across these teachings and, and you feel so grateful for having them available and all of these things is what kind of give rise to the inspiration and joy coming from the understanding, the recollection that we are in the presence of something truly awesome. Yeah, the word awesome is what we use, but maybe now is the right time to use the word awesome. And yeah, for once it is suited. We should use these kind of superlatives less, otherwise they become meaningless. But here it is really in this place to use the word awesome. Man. So it's powerful. It's got something very important there. And it gives you a sense of moisture in your life. Yeah. They talk about dry insight in the public commentaries. And dry insight is insight which is not conjoined with a happiness of the stillness of the mind or the samadhi of the mind. Yeah? The moisture is the joy in life. That is the moisture. Without that, there is no. And there is that is lacking there. And it's interesting how does this faith arise? This faith in Buddhism can arise in many ways, but uh, you know, you can read the suttas. I think the suttas are very powerful. But one of the things that is very useful for faith to arise is also to sometimes see people who have practiced the path for a long time and see some of the results, see the results in their behavior, their consistency. Uh, their energy, and they have always very energetic, tend to be, they are very generous in the way they are, and they <coughs> very, <coughs> excuse me, they <coughs> very rare that you, they will display any kind of defilements or things, they will have a tremendous degree of kindness toward them, to people around them. When you see all of these qualities coming together in one person consistently over long periods of time, and, then it becomes very impressive. Yeah, it becomes very, wow, there's something going on here. What is going on here? You become very interested in that. Of course, it takes a bit of wisdom on our own part to recognize these things. We have to be able to know what to look out for. What are the qualities truly worthy of the, uh, admiration in this world? And you know, yeah, sometimes we, we tend to get sidetracked by silly things, but we have to look deeper into the personality. And when we see that, it is incredibly attractive. Man. We find the suttas where they say that um, just seeing an arahant, yeah, just seeing an arahant in, in your life uh, is an incredibly, incredible blessing. Man. And it is an incredible blessing precisely for these reasons, uh, because you're seeing something that is not normal. Man. You're seeing something that is completely blows you away as is completely different from what you're used to. Someone with a kind of steady peace, uh, Steady happiness, steady uh, steadiness, and all of these positive qualities. Uh, and when you see that, you it opens up uh, the possibility of a different reality, something more than the ordinary life. Uh, if the ordinary life is all we have, yeah, the ordinary life of uh, you know running around in the sensory realm and meeting people here, um, having a family, having a job, doing all the ordinary things. And these things can be meaningful to some extent, but. But they also have it, they're also very limited. They're lacking in the larger vision of reality. They're lacking in a deeper sense of the meaning of life. Yeah. Okay, so you have children, you raise them, and then you die, and then, then they raise new children, and they die. But we have it goes on and on in a kind of endless cycle without real purpose. But when you have a glimpse of a deeper reality just by seeing an arahant or seeing someone who is special, then you get this feeling that there's something more in this world there. There is a kind of Depth to this world, there's a potential for the bliss and meaning that is out of range of most ordinary people, but it is there. You have to get this feeling that there's something there, and that is so inspiring when you see that. You know, you get drawn towards that, and as you get drawn to it, you start to uncover some of that meaning yourself gradually, gradually, slowly, slowly in your own life by developing in the right way by following this path, and you start to see there is really something there. And it gets really exciting because then you start to extrapolate it. You start to ask, well, if I got this much so far, where is it going to end? It might end somewhere pretty, pretty amazing. If I only starting out already, it is kind of turning into something so positive. Right? So this gives like the moisture to your mind, get a sense of purpose, of meaning, of joy. Life is no longer dry, the desert is left behind, you enter the wet jungle. And you know, you get lots of food and all these kind of things. You pluck the mangoes and the mango trees, uh, 
you get a nice jungle banana from the banana tree. The jungle banana is much better than the shop bananas. Yeah, they are small, they are powerful, they are. We had a, some bananas in the monastery that they were called monkey bananas, and tiny small bit bananas. You know, and Adam Brown renamed them to monk bananas. They are not monkey, but monk bananas. Yeah? And we had this massive tray of monk bananas, yeah? and they were delicious. So you go into the jungle, you get some of these monk bananas. Yeah. That doesn't mean you turn into a monk straight away. It just means that you are enjoying it. And, and uh, so then it gets a sense of moisture, a sense of meaning, a sense of happiness yeah, that you otherwise don't have. And this is very much part of this idea of faith, of confidence in the bigger picture in something more in life. And of course, the Buddha, he promises something pretty extreme. He promises the highest happiness that is attainable for human beings. The end of all suffering, the highest meaning that we can possibly have. And it is kind of, uh, it is really awesome what this path promises. Uh, so then we have to figure out whether it really delivers. Uh, it's based on faith, based on that practice, we're going to carry on. And then as we carry on, we start to discover that wisdom is the precious gem of humans. Uh, yeah, wisdom and faith, sadhaha and panya two sides of the same coin. And, and uh, wisdom, of course, is this idea that uh, uh, you understand the nature of reality. And, and when you understand the nature of reality, basically it means you understand happiness and suffering. And it means you understand where to look for it. And it means you understand where to avoid things so you can avoid the suffering in life. But that is the most important thing to understand. Yeah, if you understand that, happiness and suffering in a real deep way, well, that, of course, is exactly what we're always looking for. So that's precisely why this is called wisdom. And the wisdom is the highest faculty among uh, what, that we can have as a human being or any kind of being. Yeah. Wisdom is the faculty that stabilizes all the other faculties. Uh, in the suit that we're talking about five faculty, the faculty is like an ability, yeah? it's like a power that we have inside of us that can is something that is there that we can use almost a faculty of something, and so the faculty of wisdom stabilizes the other four faculties, which are is your confidence of faith, the sadhana. Yeah, it is your energy. When you have wisdom, you tend to be energized because you you know what you're doing, and you you are heading in the right way. You're energized for that because you know it's going to be positive. Yeah, mindfulness is 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 uh, stabilized. We tend to be mindful all pretty much all the time. You know what's going on, and, and samadhi, the stillness of the mind, is also stabilized as a consequence. Uh, so, with wisdom faculty, once it is really established, uh, yeah, as a real gem, once you become a screen or whatever, all the other faculties are also there. And one of the consequences of that is that if you have real insight into the Dhamma. If you really are supposedly a stream entry, yeah? lots of people in the world claim to be stream entries. Uh, and I would uh, warn you to take a lot of those claims with a pinch, uh, with a spoon, a shovel full of salt, uh, because there is a lot of dodgy claims out there in the world. Yeah? Uh, but uh, one of the ways of knowing that is that they enter Samadhi really easily, yeah? Because wisdom stabilizes the other faculties and someone who is a streamman who will enter Samadhi without much difficulty. That is one of the differences. Once they get over their tiredness, they go on retreat, it doesn't take long before Samadhi is established. So um, wisdom is the gem of a humans because it gives you access to everything you really want in this life anything you ever wanted is right there for the taking when you are wise um then the last one merit is hard for thieves to steal yeah and uh, of course the point here is that thieves will carry away everything you own in this life but they will take your girlfriend or boyfriend, not, not literally, this is kind of a metaphorical thief. They have someone who is, who is kind of, uh, uh, anyway, has the interest in, um, in your partner, whatever it might be. Or, you know, so everything in this life is subject to loss. And everything in this life is subject to passing and to disappearing. Yeah. There's a beautiful sutta, the, also, I think, here in the Devata Sangita, what the Buddha says that uh, when a house is burning, it is the saucepan 
that is uh, stable, that is useful. The saucepan that you take out, or the kettle you take out of the house, that is the one that is useful. For. And the point that Buddha is making is that life is burning. Everything is always burning. Everything is kind of being raised to the ground, yeah, uh, regularly. And it is the things that are taken out. The things that are taken out are the things that are given. When we do make a gift of what we own, it cannot be burnt up anymore by samsara. The ground, you know, the impermanence, the steady earthquake, which is always there, shaking things up, making things unreliable, cannot touch those things that you have given away. Because you have already given it away, it is that you've already made merit, you know, made, made some true happiness out of that. And when samsara comes and takes away everything else you own, at least but those things you have given away will be something you carry with you into the future. It's almost the reverse of how we almost think about things. Yeah, instead of accumulating real wealth, comes through giving away this kind of a radical way, of, radical upside down way of thinking about the world. Those are the things that are saved, the things that we give away before the house burns down and everything is taken away from us. So merit is hard for thieves to steal. And hard is a bit of an understatement, and it is impossible. For merit thieves to steal merit. Everything else can be stolen, but not what you had built up in this way for yourself. So, another little verse for you. And uh, so, just because I have been getting a little bit into verse recently, because I think it nourishes the Dhamma in a slightly different way. And for that reason, it is, uh, I, I enjoy this. But now we will come back to. Promise again, back to a more uh, regular sutta, if you like. Yeah. Uh, and this is another sutta that I uh, read out of every retreat that I do. And I hope you will forgive me for doing that. And yeah, hope you will not be too fault finding and critical of me for reading out the same sutta every time. Um, because to me, it is just such a fundamental sutta in about how to live the Buddhist life. This is about how to overcome one of those most from the you know defilements that we're all really seeking to overcome, I would guess. Yeah, over how to overcome anger, how to overcome resentment specifically, irritation, all of these negative aspects of the mind. This is what this is about. And if we can find a way of reflecting or perceiving the world that can help us in overcoming this big, very big obstacle, then of course we are really on the right track. One of the very encouraging things that Buddha said about anger and ill will is that it is easy to overcome. I don't know what you think about that. You may think that's crazy to say it's easy to overcome, but the Buddha says so. It says it's relatively easy to overcome, but it is very blameworthy. Anger causes a lot of destruction for ourselves and other people. So that is a very good reason for getting rid of it. Yeah, easy and very blameworthy. So really, really worthwhile. Huh? Then he talked about the sensory pleasures of the world, the sensory objects of the world, where he said it's actually hard to overcome and it is not so blameworthy. Huh? Yeah, or it takes a long time, if you like. It's a long time, it's hard, uh, and it is not so blameworthy. Yeah, so uh, it is still going to hinder you on the Buddhist path, they're going to hinder your meditation practice, uh, but it's not blameworthy in the sense that it gives rise to so much suffering in your life and the life of others. Uh, and the last one is delusion, which is both hard to overcome and very blameworthy. Yeah, so this is like the insight into non self, etc. etc. That's what that really is about. Uh, so Overcoming anger, yeah, because it is easy, yeah, <laughs> and it is very blameworthy. It is really worthwhile uh, looking at this. And uh, I think a lot of people would uh, go a long way on the spiritual path if they put more emphasis on the kind of advice uh, that you find in this particular sutta, because uh, it is uh, you can make quite a lot of dents in your bad emotions, yeah, by following the kind of advice that you find here. Yeah. So let's get into this. So this is from the uh, numerical discourses, the Anguttara Nikaya. This is from the uh, fives, the chapter, the fifth chapter, and it's uh, in the fifth chapter because it was all itemized into items, five and five, uh, groups of five. Uh, 
and the sutta is getting rid of resentment. Agata Pativinaya Sutta, something like that. I think it's Agata Pativinaya Sutta. I haven't got the Pali here, but uh, if my memory works, then that is correct. So uh, this is how it goes. This is a sutta given by Venerable uh, Sariputta. Uh, and he was the Buddha's uh, right hand monk. Yeah, if you look on a any Buddhist shrine around the world, when it was Sariputta, would be on the Buddha's right side. Yeah, he would be sitting there, and he would often have a, a different posture. Almost all, when you see a disciple of the Buddha, ever you see a little figure, someone sitting in front of the Buddha on a shrine somewhere, they almost always have their hands in Anjali, yeah, like this towards the Buddha. There's only one monk, yeah, one monk who does not have his hands in Anjali. Yeah? And he has this other kind of slightly cool, cool posture. He kind of has one hand on the knee and the other one on the kind of the back somewhere. So he, he looks kind of slightly different. That's maybe the Sariputta. That's how you know the general of the Dhamma, yeah? the, the kind of the one who is supposed to take up the baton. If uh, the Buddha stops teaching, then the Venerable Sariputta is supposed to take up the baton and carry on the teaching if the Buddha, for some reason, cannot do it. So uh, there's quite a lot of suttas with Vendor Vasari Putta, and uh, they are tend to be profound, kind of analytical suttas, uh, but sometimes also very useful ones, like the one we have here. It's a very practical sutta as well. So uh, interesting for that reason. Uh, so this is how it goes. Again, this is Bandasujato's translation. Uh, <clears throat> there, Venerable Sariputta addressed the mendicants. Uh, Reverence, mendicants, reverend, they replied. <laughs> Sariputta said this. Reverence, a mendicant should use these five methods to completely get rid of resentment when it has arisen towards anyone. What five? In the case of a person whose behavior by body is impure, but whose behavior by speech is pure, you should get rid of resentment towards that kind of person. In the case of a person whose behavior by speech is impure, but whose behavior by body is pure, you should get rid of resentment towards that kind of person. In the case of a person whose behavior by way of body and speech is impure, but who gets an openness and clarity of the heart from time to time, you should get rid of resentment towards that kind of person too. In the case of a person whose behavior by body and speech are impure, and who doesn't get an openness and clarity of the heart from time to time, you should get rid of resentment towards that kind of person. And in the case of a person whose behavior by body and speech are pure, and who gets an openness and clarity of the heart from time to time, you should get rid of resentment towards that kind of person. So um, this is the summary of the sutta. Yeah? The suttas often had this kind of structure. The Buddha was a great teacher. He knew about uh, pedagogy for, you know, a long time before these things were taught at universities and things around the world. Uh, and uh, so you summarize it, and then you kind of give an exposition afterwards called the Udesa Vibhanga, this kind of structure in the Pali. And you see many suttas who have an Udesa, a summary followed by a Vibhanga, which is like an analysis, yeah, uh, an expansion of the brief material. And this is one example of that, uh, the great teacher, the Buddha and the available Sariputta using this kind of exposition. And so this is then, uh, uh, five kinds of different kinds of people and uh, the point here of course is that all people are included in these five kinds so the good news or the bad news depending on how you look at it is that there is no grounds for having ill will against anyone this is what this is saying yeah quite literally anyone everyone is included in this category somewhere and the reason why it is divided up into five in this way is because the method that we use to overcome resentment will vary depending on the kind of person that we are dealing with. Yeah? So there are different methods. And uh, just to briefly kind of uh, foreshadow what we're going to talk about, the, uh, the two methods are basically meta 
yeah, on the one hand, in other words, loving kindness and, and karuna, compassion, is the other one. Yeah, yeah these are the two ways, metta and karuna. And uh, so these are the ways of learning how to have metta and karuna, loving kindness and compassion towards the whole world, really. Yeah. And one of the interesting things is that, uh, uh, you know, that, that the overcoming of anger is very closely related to the idea of developing metta, because uh, you cannot really have metta towards someone you're angry with, uh, yeah? So the idea is that you have to get rid of the anger and ill will first. If there's any kind of negative feeling towards someone or whatever it might be, you have to overcome that first. And only then is it really possible to develop metta or even karuna. And uh, this is uh, what you find if you, it is a very nice sutta that you may want to look up. I maybe it should have included it here. It's called the uh, Kakachupama Sutta, the uh, simile of the soul, 21st sutta of the Majjhima the middle length sayings of the Buddha. And it has this long exposition on development of metta. It has a very famous simile that you may remember, and the simile of the saw, which says that even if the bandits come with a two-handled saw or with a chainsaw or whatever, they, they dismember you limb by limb, yeah, cutting your limbs off the body. And uh, even in that case, you shouldn't have any ill will towards that person, that bandit. It's a very high standard, yeah, setting the bar really, really high. Yeah? But one of the points of that sutta is that when you start doing your loving kindness meditation, first thing you have to do is to overcome ill will and anger. Yeah, all of that has to be neutralized first of all, so that there's no no one in the world that you have any negative thoughts towards it. Then it becomes possible, maybe, to do metta practice. So that is always a starting point for metta. So these things are very integrated with each other, you overcome the ill will. The assumption here, of course, is that you're not angry with anyone, really. You don't have any enemies in the world. This is kind of one of the basic assumptions here. And as Buddhists, we can't really afford to have enemies. Yeah, it's a kind of crazy idea to have enemies. What other people think about you or do to you, that's their business. But we can't really afford to have enemies in the world. The moment you have an enemy, you have a real problem and you are, you know, you. You're letting yourself down because you are carrying defilements around with you in your mind. So we can't really afford that. And uh, it is actually quite easy to overcome that. So we overcome that straight away. So then, because we have overcome that generally in our life, we tend to be friendly towards everyone. It means that the moment a bit of ill will arises, uh, that moment you get rid of it straight away, you deal with it. So how is this done? And this is what this sutta is about. So we're going to start with the first kind of person huh? and uh, see what the Venerable Sariputta has to say about this. Uh, how should you get rid of resentment yeah, or ill will, if you like, for a person whose behavior by body is impure, but whose behavior by speech is pure? Suppose a mendicant wearing rag robes sees a rag by the side of the road. They hold it down and with the left foot, spread it out with the right foot, tear out an intact section and take it away with them. In the same way, at, the time, at that time, you should ignore the person's impure behavior by body and focus on their pure behavior by speech. That is how to get rid of resentment for that person. Yeah, so here we have a person who has both good qualities and bad qualities. Yeah, it is here divided up into uh, bad qualities by body. Sorry. Um, yeah, uh, bad qualities are body, but good qualities by speech. But really, I think it's just a way of saying that people have some bad qualities and they have good qualities, yeah? And it's up to us to, to kind of uh, to understand the difference here, yeah? To be able to separate out the good from the bad. And the simile here is very kind of descriptive of how this is done. So you have a mendicant who wears rag robes. And I used to have one of those rag robes. And I used to travel around the world in my rag robe. I looked a bit like, a, some people said I looked like a Christmas tree, yeah? like very colorful, 
and decorate in it because the rag row we kind of get all kind of shape. We're supposed to have this simple row with brown, right? But you get many shades of brown. And if you get enough shades of brown in the right combination, it can be look really kind of a, like a Christmas tree, perhaps. I don't know if it's Christmas tree is the right word, but something pretty colorful. And when I traveled around the world's airport, this is now 20 years ago when I did this, uh, people really kind of, people try not to look at me, but somehow they kind of, they sort of, you can see the eyes were kind of being drawn towards me because they looked so utterly out of the ordinary. That was good fun, actually. Because that's one of the, the <laughs> It's actually quite nice because it is a very simple robe. Yeah, it's really, really simple. And uh, you, it is, this has absolutely zero value because it's just all these kind of patches and things that you pick up from here and there and you draw it together. And you do find monks who have robes like this. Uh, mine was perhaps a little bit over the top, but uh, it still, it was kind of nice, at least initially, to have a robe like that. So these monks exist even in the present day. Uh, and perhaps some nuns too, I'm not sure, uh, who, who use this kind of... Uh, practice. So, so you're wearing a rag robe. And when you wear a rag robe, because the rags have a tendency to kind of come apart because they are old and you get holes everywhere and maybe the seam kind of fractures because the, the cloth is weak or whatever, you're always on the lookout for more rags. Yeah, you're walking along the road, uh, not so much in the airports, perhaps not so many rags in the airports, but when you walk around the road or, or somewhere, you're looking out, is there a rag robe here, some, a rag here somewhere? And you find a rag, yay, a rag. Yeah, I can patch my, my robe. <laughs> so you find a rag, and when you find a rag in the ditch next to the road, of course, you know that that rag is going to have certain parts that are going to be rotten, and certain parts are going to be maybe stained beyond use, yeah? So what you do, as it says here, you see that rag, you take it out, you hold it down with, with one foot, and then you spread it out with the other foot, yeah? So you get to see what that cloth looks like. You get to see the good parts. You get to see the bad parts. In the same way with a person, it is like you kind of spread out the qualities of that person, yeah, from the really bad to the very good. You spread them out in your mind's eye and you remind yourself of all the qualities of this person. Yeah, you spread out and then you have clarity about it. And then when you see what is going on like that, well, then you tear out the section which is good. And the rubbish, the thing that is rotten, the thing that is stained beyond use, you throw it out, you throw it out because it is rubbish. You don't want to carry rubbish with you, but you carry the intact part with you. In the same way, when you spread out all the qualities of that person, you tear it down the middle, and the left side, where all the bad qualities are, you crumple it up and you throw it out. You chuck it in the toilet and you flush the toilet afterwards and you get rid of it. Why? Because it's rubbish. It is not useful. And then you take the good qualities and you take the good qualities into your heart. And yeah, you, you dwell on those good qualities. You remember how important they are. How, what a wonderful thing it is to have people who have such qualities in the world. And you build that up into something beautiful, something that you will remember in the future. You make a very clear note of those good qualities. And then in the future, if a problem should re-arise with that person again in the future, that because the good qualities are stored in your mind, you bring out that memory. That memory will overpower the negative qualities. Bang! Yeah. And then you don't have that ill will against that person anymore. That is how it works. So when we talk about, we did talk about the other day about the idea of substitution, as it sometimes is called, when you substitute one thought for another, this is how you do that. You can't just substitute through an act of force. You have to do it really meaning it. It has to come from something deep inside. You have to believe in what you're doing. You have to really believe that these are the good qualities in this person, yeah? And then that substitution will work because you actually are focusing on real good qualities uh, and then you're bringing it up uh, and then you kind of annihilate the bad ones from your mind. Uh. And um, this is not so, not very hard to do, yeah? And this is something every one of you is able to do if you really try, if you really go for it. And, and uh, an example of this would be, for example, now, now we are, you know, all here with a group of people meditating together, taking the spiritual path of Buddhism 
very seriously. This is what this is about, taking these teachings very seriously when you listen to these kind of suttas. Yeah? And uh, when we do that, when we meet with a group of people like this, we know that these are people with really good intentions. No one in this group is going to be perfect. I, I don't think so anyway, unless there's, it probably wouldn't be here if you were an arahant already. So let's assume that uh, no one here is perfect. But uh, and that's okay. We shouldn't expect perfection in this world. Yeah, we all grow up in such an imperfect world that so much of the things that have influenced us over life, that have conditioned us over a lifetime, are things that are going to drag us in the wrong way. Of course, we're not going to be perfect. That's to be expected. We should be able to forgive each other for that. But what is marvelous is that despite all of those difficulties, despite all the wrong views, the wrong ideas, the bad conditioning, all the people that have kind of led us astray in this life still, we're able to kind of get rid of that somehow. Yeah, well, not get rid of it, but at least bypass it to some extent and then develop good qualities instead. At least we have that good intention there. And also we are moving forward on the path in the right way. That is something to be celebrated. It's something to rejoice in. Yeah. So when you look at your fellow Buddhists, and because we are fellow Buddhists and we are trying to work together on this path in this way, it means that we have to interact to some extent. And when we interact, we're going to rub up it against each other to some extent. That's the nature of interaction. And that is so important and that we remember the big picture and we stand back and remember what we are all trying to do remembering the good qualities that are there, because the moment we lose sight of the good qualities, then all the small irritations, all the niggly, tiny, petty things of life are going to take over, and it's going to become more important than the big picture. Yeah? This is how you do this, yeah? And then when you do this in this way, yeah, it actually it can be really, really powerful and very, very useful. So please try this in your life. Please put a lot of emphasis on it. Because if you can deal directly with these defilements of the mind, what it means is that the conduct by body and by speech, all the external conduct, tends to fall into place by itself. Sure, we have to watch our speech, we have to watch our actions. But if you can deal with the mind directly, it is almost as if the other aspects of virtue kind of fall into place. Yeah, it is like now you are kind of doing something which embraces all aspects of virtue in one go. And this is why it is so powerful. Now, uh, sometimes, you know, when we when I speak like this, or other people speak like this, then there are people who say, but is this really being realistic? Yeah, how can we focus just on the good qualities in people? People don't just have good qualities. We all know that. Aren't we just kind of deceiving ourselves by just looking at the good? Isn't the purpose of the Buddhist path to see reality as it actually is? And aren't we here blotting out part of that reality, just seeing the good parts? And it's a very interesting critique. It is, a, you know, because that is true to some extent. We are here to see reality. Yeah, this is kind of the point. But the issue here is well, what reality is it that we are out to see? And the reality we're out to see is not about individual people. It's not about understanding individual people. The reality that we are out to see is a bigger picture thing about the nature of the world as a whole, yeah, or the nature of the human mind as a whole, not uh, kind of small issues or small conditioned aspect of the human mind. So the truth is that it is impossible to know another human being fully in terms of their, their personal qualities. Yeah, because these qualities, they come and go. Sometimes we may get a glimpse of, a, of the qualities of another person, but the next day those qualities may have disappeared. There may be a different person. Who is that person anyway? One person may like them, another person may not like them. Which one is true? And the answer is, none of them is true. None of our perceptions is right. Yeah? A, a person's uh, uh, qualities is beyond the ability for a single person to understand. We don't even know our own good qualities sometimes. Yeah? We are really blinded about ourselves. We don't really understand how we are or what we are as human beings. So when we can't understand other people or even ourselves, how can we judge another person? 
How is it possible to have a realistic outlook of another person? Actually, it is absolutely unrealistic. We cannot have a realistic outlook or understanding of another person. It's just impossible. Then. It is impossible precisely because they are not a stable thing. This is follows from the idea of non-self, that we're always changing, always moving around. There's nothing there you can grasp hold of and say, this is the real person. So the idea of understanding an individual in this way, as they really are, is misguided. That is not useful for the Buddhist path. Understanding impermanence, yes, is very useful. Understanding non-self, yes. But these are bigger picture things. They're not about individuals quite in the same way. So there's another question that we need to ask, and that is the question of what is useful? What works on the Buddhist path? What is going to give results in our practice? That is the question that matters. Not seeing people in the right way, which just turns out to be impossible, but what is useful in my own spiritual progress? And there, the answer is very simple. Whatever helps me to overcome defilements, yeah, that is what is going to be useful. It has to be based on some kind of realism, because if it is completely fake, of course, then it's going to be undermined very easily and you will lose it. But if it is based on some degree of realism, some degree of seeing the good qualities in the other person, which actually are there, then it is sustainable and it's going to help you to move forward on the Buddhist path. So that is really the criterion that we need to use for whether, uh, for what perception is right. Is it helpful to reduce the defilements or is it helpful to increase the defilements? And that is the kind of the answer to that particular question. And uh, then you are on the right track. Then you are uh, kind of thinking about this idea of meta in the right way and doing it in a way that actually is useful. Does it work on the path? That does it reduce the defilements or does it increase the defilements? In fact, that is one of those teachings that you see throughout the suttas and that the Buddha uses everywhere and how you can decide on anything in life. Should I be a Buddhist or should I be not a Buddhist? Should I, be a, should I have this kind of job or not? Should I be a monastic or not? Should I have these kind of friends or that kind of friends, this kind of job, that kind of job? Should I, what kind of car should I drive? What kind of haircut should I have? Um, you know, this kind of stuff. Yeah, all of that really should be decided by one single question. Is it going to lead to wholesome qualities in the long run? More wholesome qualities? And is it going to lead to a decline in unwholesome qualities? In other words, is it going to move me forward on the Buddhist path or backwards? Everything in life should be measured in terms of that because this is the only criterion that really matters. If you're serious about the spiritual life, if you understand that this is about the meaning of life, this is what makes the whole difference between happiness and suffering, this is where you've discovered what you really wanted, then what else are you going to use as a criterion? There's nothing else worthy of being used. This is the only criterion that matters. Does it bring, does it bring you forward on that path or does it not bring you forward on that path? And if it brings you forward, then you are on the right track. Yeah. So I think that is a good place to stop uh, because uh, we can then carry on with this uh, marvelous sutta uh, later on this afternoon. Huh? But I think now is a good time to do some meditation together. So let's turn to some meditation instead. Huh? So here we go. Huh?
Okay, everyone. So just uh, come back to the basic instructions and come back to the simple things every time. Uh, the basic things that need to be in place for the meditation to work. Uh, make sure you are comfortable, sitting in a nice way, uh, not super duper indulgent, but just right, just to be at ease uh, so the body can be at ease and the mind gradually falling into place, also being at ease. Uh, because again, these two things are so closely connected to each other. And then just relax, uh, allow the world and your mind just to flow, flow with the flow, as I say. Uh, don't control things. Uh, nudge your mind to understand where real meaning and happiness is to be found. Uh, it is to be found in the spiritual path. Uh, let go of that world outside, which is forever problematic, forever leading you to absolutely nowhere uh, this is the real path that uh, this is where meaning is uh, and allow your mind to gently incline towards that meaning uh.
and uh, just enjoy that uh, freedom from worldly concerns and having left all the world behind the, the jobs, the relationships, all the little things that life is so full of, uh, all of that is left behind uh, and just enjoy that freedom from that, the peace that arises when all of these things have been left behind. Uh, try to see this distinction between the spiritual path uh, and the worldly life. Uh, And uh, now I will take the meditation in a slightly different direction. And, and please just follow only if you feel at ease, only if you feel this is natural for you and you don't feel any problems with it. Uh, if you feel uncomfortable, then, then please do something else. Uh, just start off by imagining yourself that you are in a room and in this room there is a very simple bed uh, with white linen on it uh, and you're lying on this on just a very ordinary mattress uh, you're lying on your back uh, the door to the room is closed uh, and there is no window in this room uh, the walls are white the linen is white uh, and there's no decoration there's nothing of interest in this room whatsoever uh, and you have, you're wearing some kind of white uh, hospital gown or something like that. Uh, everything, there's nothing more in this life of interest. Uh, and you know that you're passing away, your death uh, is only a matter of hours, maybe an hour or two, uh, and that will be the end of your life. Uh, you know that between now and your passing away, uh, you will not be meeting or talking to any other human beings. Uh, you're literally lying there waiting to die here. What does it feel like?
And uh, just ask yourself the question then, are you ready to die? Yeah. And as the time slowly creeps on, and you realize that this world is now coming to an end, and because you understand that this world is coming to an end, you realize that you have to let go of things, not just externally, not just superficially, but deep inside, psychologically. And the first thing that we all have to let go of is obviously all the possessions in our, in our life. Uh, whatever it is that we have as our dearest possessions, uh, the most cherished things that we may have inherited from uh, past generations or our house or whatever it is, uh, everything, uh, everything has to go. Uh, so let go of all of that. Uh, And as the time moves forward, uh, you realize there are many more things to let go of in this life. Uh, and one of the very obvious ones is all the friends and family members and acquaintances, uh, all the people in your life. Uh, now is the time to say a final goodbye, uh, to wish them well, uh, but to move on into your own future uh, by yourself. Uh, go into your own future with a degree of courage uh, and leave all the other people behind for now. Uh.
and uh, as you get closer and closer to the final point of this life, uh, you realize that there is even more that you have to let go of. Uh, and one of the things we have to let go of uh, is all the aspects of our identity, uh, of who we think we are, uh, that are tied up with this world. Uh, so much of what we take ourselves to be uh, has to do with how we relate to this world, uh, our gender, uh, our family background, uh, our education, uh, our uh, country of residence, whatever it might be, uh, so many of those aspects. Uh, so say goodbye to all those aspects of identity that are tied to, the, to this world. Uh, and you will find that there is really only one thing left that you carry forward with you. Uh, and that is uh, the goodness of your heart, uh, that warm glow inside. Uh, so move forward with that. Uh. And uh, as the point of death uh, comes ever closer, uh, you realize that even your physical body will have to be left behind. Uh, and what a wonderful thing it is to leave behind this heavy physical body uh, and all the identity that comes with that. Uh, again, your gender, uh, but also just the identity with the uh, uh, that body in general. Uh, and all that remains now is this uh, a cloud of mind, uh, the qualities of your heart. Uh, now there truly is nothing else left behind. Uh.
And there, there comes a point in this process that we are no longer sure whether you are dead or alive. And you realize it doesn't really matter at all, but because this journey of emptying out, of leaving things behind, it leaves this beautiful emptiness, this beautiful sense of lightness and peace inside of you. And you understand that this process of dying is actually so beautiful. And you start to ask yourself, why is it that you were ever afraid of this beautiful process? And as you gradually move on, taking all the good qualities of your heart with you into your future, and you start to feel this enormous sense of gratitude. This gratitude to all your Kalyanamitas, all your fellow Buddhists, all the people in this life, your, now your previous life, who made this possible for you who have guided you in the right direction, uh, who have helped you to understand life and death uh, and the purpose of all of this. Uh, you feel this wonderful sense of gratitude uh, for making this last moment so beautiful. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, all those people in my life for sharing this path with me.
And uh, as you are recalling all these marvelous Kalyanamitas uh, with all their beautiful qualities, uh, send them uh, your metta and compassion. Uh, and all of you, may all of you be well and may you be happy. Uh, may you have a wonderful continued existence. Uh, and then spread it out, out and out uh, to include all the beings in the known universe. Uh, all beings out there, uh, all those beings who deserve and who strive for happiness, uh, some of them with very beautiful and kind hearts. Uh, may you all be well and may you all be happy. Uh,
And uh, now just uh, come back to your breath uh, and just stay with your breath for a couple of minutes. Uh. And uh, once again, we're coming close to the end, but please take a moment or two just to reflect on the meditation so far. Yeah. What has happened during the meditation? Uh, are you feeling more at ease and peaceful? Uh, and ask yourself why that is the case. Uh, what are the perceptions that lead to greater peace? Uh, what is the inclination of the mind that leads you in that same direction there? Okay, everyone, so uh, I'll bye-bye for now. See you back in a couple of hours.